the final iteration of my tune here. Do centrifugal superchargers have lag? The maximum amount of boost that can be created. Look at this absolute beauty. Oh, she's quicker. Can you drive with an open blow off valve? What's up everybody, it's Greg Peters with the Car Passion Channel here and today's video I'm just gonna deem the supercharger special. What started as just a quick simple dyno day video has evolved into much more than that. I'll be going over the whole centrifugal supercharger system that I installed on my NB Miata recently, how the whole thing works, I'll throw it on the dyno, give it a full tune and see how much power I can crank out of it, and then towards the end of the video I'll be answering a ton of your guys' questions about superchargers that you've asked in my YouTube, Instagram, and Patreon comments, which shout out to everyone who's become a patron of the Car Passion channel so far. I love you guys for your support. If you're interested in doing so, I'll link that down below in the description. But for now, let's just jump into what even is a centrifugal supercharger and should you install one on your Miata? So this supercharger kit is by a company called Track Dog Racing, and I just wanna say up front that this video is not sponsored and the kit was not provided to me. I actually bought this kit used from someone else that just decided to go to a K-Swap in their Miata. So there's also not gonna be a full install video on the kit for two main reasons. At the time I bought the kit, I really just wanted to work on my car and not worry about turning it into a big, huge production. I was able to install the entire kit in just one weekend. I mean, I legit went from non-boosted Miata to complete boosted Miata supercharged two days. It was very easy and straightforward. If I were to turn that into an install video, it would have taken me at least a month. The other reason is, and keep this in mind when you're looking over all the components, is it's actually for an NA8 Miata and I've installed it into an NB. So I didn't want to put a bunch of effort into making this huge install production and have it not be for the right year of car and have not everything like fit perfect the way the track dog intended it. However, if there's a demand for it, and if Track Dog would be interested in it, I would love to do a full start to finish every nut and bolt install for this kit because it was a joy to install. So possibly a future video. So let's jump into what all is included in this kit and why you would want to choose this versus another form of forced induction on your Miata. A centrifugal supercharger is belt driven the way you'd expect any supercharger to be, but instead of having a big housing with a set of lobes inside, this is known as a twin screw or a roots type supercharger, made famous mostly by videos like this. <laughs> A centrifugal supercharger is actually more like a belt-driven turbocharger. Inside of the housing is essentially a compressor wheel, just like the one you'd find in a turbocharger, but instead of harnessing exhaust energy and spooling it up, the engine spins it via a belt that's attached to the crank. The faster the engine spins, the faster the supercharger spins, the more air it flows, and the more power it adds. But I'll get into the specifics of the power band later. So how do all these components come together and fit inside the engine bay? So let's start with the supercharger plate. This bolts to the engine and the supercharger is mounted to that. Now this kit clears both air conditioning and power steering as you can see here because the NB has both of those and the supercharger that's mounted here is a C30-94 which is capable of above 400 horsepower with the right setup. The compressor itself actually has the same maximum flow rate as the turbocharger in my red NA which is about 53 pounds per minute but the horsepower rating isn't quite as high. I'm guessing that's mostly due to the fact that with a supercharger, you do have a parasitic loss. So it might take 40 horsepower to drive this thing at 400 horsepower. So the engine might be making 440, but you're only gonna get 400 to the wheels due to how much of the engine's horsepower is actually being used to spin the supercharger. The supercharger gets its air through, you guessed it, an intake. And look at this absolute beauty. This is not the factory intake that comes with the Track Dog Racing Kit. This is actually from my friends over at Nap Motorsports. They make a direct replacement for the Track Dog Racing intake, including the port for the bypass valve and everything like that so if you want to get yourself one of these you can check out nap motorsports on instagram so the air is pulled in by the supercharger and gets compressed which of course heats it up and that's why it gets sent directly to the intercooler through some very direct piping the radiator does get relocated slightly in order to make room for this piping and have the hood clear and all that but it's a really easy process after that compressed air gets cooled down by the intercooler it gets let into the engine and makes for one happy driver now with the supercharger if i'm just cruising at 4,000 rpm it's flowing 
blowing a ton of air. It doesn't care about load, it only cares about RPM. So now you've got a ton of air all the time that has to go somewhere, which means you need a bypass valve, which you can recirculate or vent to atmosphere, which I'll get into a little demo on that later in the video. The Track Dog kit does include a bypass valve, but it's kind of a cheap one, and I'm an absolute TurboSmart fanboy, so I had to make that upgrade. The ultra high quality TurboSmart bypass valve fits right in with no modification necessary. And you can also configure this to recirculate or vent to atmosphere. Now, if you know a little bit about the physics of compressors, you know they have to spin really fast in order to generate the kind of airflow required to make horsepower. And that all starts with a set of pulleys. On the crankshaft, I've got a stock diameter 130 millimeter pulley. And on the supercharger itself, I have a 90 millimeter pulley. The ratio of those two numbers is 1.44 to one, which means for every one RPM the engine spins, the supercharger will spin 1.44 RPM, or if the engine spins to 7,000 RPM, it spins the supercharger up to 10,000. But that is not near fast enough to make any power. So the centrifugal supercharger has a gearbox inside of it that amplifies that RPM even farther. In fact, it's 9.49 to 1, so almost 10 times faster. That means with this pulley setup, with the engine RPM at 7,000, the supercharger spins almost 96,000 RPM. And that's what it takes to generate boost. Now with things spinning that fast, of course you're gonna be generating a lot of heat, not only with the air you're compressing, but also the oil inside the gearbox of the supercharger. Now this thing has its own fluid circuit, it's got its own reservoir, and it's got a cooler. And it's extremely important that this cooler gets enough airflow, especially if you're running your car at the track, because you have to keep the Rotrex fluid cool in order to get the most longevity out of your supercharger. I also chose to upgrade the harmonic balancer on the engine from stock to a fluid damper, and I decided to go with fluid damper over ATI just because the fluid damper is so much easier to install. You don't have to mess with the timing belt or worry about it being an extremely tight, nearly impossible fit. All you have to do is take off your accessory belt and you basically just bolt this thing on in place of the stock damper. Some other ancillary bits in the Track Dog Racing Kit include hood struts, since the stock hood prop actually can't fit with the intercooler piping. You get a catch can to help manage blow-by, which is extremely important for boosted applications. You get a heat shield, which fits on both the stock exhaust manifold and pretty much any headers, and that really helps keep heat out of the engine bay. And you get a bunch of ducting that helps direct air all the places it's supposed to go, and that's really important because you do relocate the radiator with this kit, so it's important to keep all that ducting in place. And all this stuff is chassis specific, so I am ending up having to make all of my own ducting since, again, this is an NA8 kit going into an NB. And on that note, the upper radiator plate is also chassis specific, but TrackDog did send me out the NB variant so I could complete that part of the kit. So a huge shout out to them for that. So that is the TrackDog Racing Rotrex Centrifugal Supercharger Kit, but enough talk. What do you say we get this thing on the dyno and make some noise? Take it away, Craig. I'm pretty sure you know where I'm at by now. My second home, Advanced Engine Dynamics, your one-stop shop for Southern California Miata tuning. And today we have the Rotrex Supercharged NB Miata, and we're ready to annoy the neighbors, make some power, and hopefully keep all the connecting rods inside the block. Predictions for today. I know in a previous video, it made 207 on Virtual Dyno. First thing I'm gonna do, baseline pull. See what it makes. My prediction is, is that it is gonna be somewhat close to virtual dyno, but typically what happens is as soon as I put any of the cars on the dyno, they start misfiring. We have to gap the plugs down. So I think it's probably gonna make like 190 on the first pull, probably have to gap the plugs down, and then we'll be up into this low 200s. And then I'll start playing with ignition timing after I make sure the fueling is good and try to crank that up just a little bit more. Supposedly this setup, Rotrex C3094, on the previous car that it was on, made 295 on E85. Today, the car is just on 91 octane, so obviously not gonna be pushing it quite that hard. Hopefully, I'll see mid 200s, maybe 230, 240. I would be very happy with that. That would actually be more power than it made on the 100 shot of nitrous, except I get to enjoy this all the time without having to refill the pesky bottle.
here's the baseline dyno run, and although it is a bit disappointing on the numbers side, I must say, virtual dyno, right on the money, within about two horsepower of the actual dyno jet. It's a great tool when it's used properly. Anyways, you can see we got some funkiness going on, 204 peak horsepower, and typically on a Rotrek setup, you're gonna expect to see that torque curve continue on flat out, and the horsepower curve is gonna climb all the way to red line. So we gapped down the plugs, added a couple degrees of timing, and continued on with the poles. So here you can see the engine obviously really liked that couple extra degrees of ignition advance. This is only about three degrees in the high RPM range. And I don't think a couple degrees of timing just magically added 34 wheel horsepower. It's, it looks from the graphs, like in the blue run, it didn't have a misfire that it had in the red run because it didn't have that abrupt drop in power. So wasn't really sure what was going on at this point, but definitely made some more power. 238 at the wheels on that pole. So from here on out, I just continued to mess with the ignition timing, the fuel and the VVT a little bit. And doing a tune on a Rotrex car is actually really simple. It's basically like doing a tune on a naturally aspirated car. There's really not that much more to it. You gotta be a little bit more careful with detonation since you are in boost, but you don't have any boost control to worry about just because the boost is always gonna be fixed at a certain RPM with a Rotrex. I mean, if you change the pulley, you do change the boost, but the boost is still fixed at any given RPM. Anyways, this was a really easy, almost boring dyno day, uh, but I'm really happy with how the car turned out. So let's check out those final numbers. I think I'm getting to the final iteration of my tune here. I'm about to do a pull on the changes that I just made. I also let the car cool off just a little bit. So hoping to see that 250 wheel mark one last time and then um, I'm pretty much done. There's not much more I can do. So let's see how it goes. Here's the best power pull of the day, 260 horsepower at the wheels, compared to 205 when it rolled into the shop. This thing is gonna feel incredible. Now I did end up pulling about three degrees of ignition timing out of the high RPM, which brought it down to 250 wheel horsepower, just to give myself a little extra safety buffer for those hot days. The 10 horsepower is just not worth pushing the limits that hard, especially on 91 octane. Now on E85, of course, this thing will be able to crank out a little bit more, but this thing's gonna be an absolute ripper of a daily driver, and I'm stoked on how it came out. You can see in the chart, still dealing with a little bit of a misfire. Never really figured out what that was. I think it's an ignition related issue. So I'll have to diagnose that later, but you can see it picks right back up in the top end once it kind of comes back online. Not really that big of a deal. All right, I gotta give it a little rip. Normally when I get off the dyno, I like to just cruise home, get home safe, you know, but uh, no harm in a little pull. She's quicker. Man, what a difference 50 horsepower makes. That top end is so much better, so much stronger. That's a wrap for the dyno day. Great success. Now I got about an hour and a half drive home and I gotta start editing. Now, before I get off the topic of dyno charts, I wanna talk about a couple things that you guys actually brought up in the comments section. Quite a few people said something along the lines of, why would you put a Rotrex on your car when you could put a twin screw on your car and make torque, bro? Don't you like torque, bro? And I'm not here to say one system is objectively better than the other. I'm more here to just provide some information and let you make that decision for yourself. So take a look at this chart behind me. What I have here is an MP62 Roots type supercharger, which is 
is a really common type people put on a Miata against my Rotrek setup. And I'm just looking at torque curves here because when you start doing torque and horsepower overlaid, the graphs get really convoluted and it's hard to tell what's what. So as you can see, the Roots Supercharger is undoubtedly the king of low RPM. I mean, at 3000 RPM, it's making gobs more torque than the Rotrex does. But then around 5000 RPM, the Rotrex absolutely takes over. So this really isn't about deciding which one is best, but more deciding which one is best for you. For me personally, when I'm trying to go fast, I'm up here. I'm up in the high RPM just giving it a rip. But if you're the type of person that wants that power available on tap all the time, if you're taking off from stoplights, just cruising around town, and you want that punchiness off the line, then Roots type is probably more for you. That's where you're gonna get all this extra power down here. And a Roots supercharged Miata engine is gonna have the most similar feeling to just dropping a V6 in the car. But the downfall is you're not gonna make as much top end horsepower. So I got another one for you. So many people say some iteration of Rotrex cars feel stock below 4K. And although they're not torque monsters in the low RPM, that statement is clearly false. Looking at this, which is a dyno of my stock engine versus where it sits right now. If you look down in the 3000 RPM range, the Rotrex car is still making 25% more power than stock. So it's absolutely gonna dig out of those low RPM corners better than if it was just a stock engine. And even all the way down at 2500 RPM, the Rotrex car is still making about 20% more power than if it was stock. And it is only able to make a couple pounds of boost down there, but hey, power is power, am I right? Okay, I have one more for you, bear with me. I know we're getting into the nitty gritty here, but this chart behind me is the current Rotrex setup against one of my old stock block turbo setups. And again, torque curves only, so it's real clear to see what engines are making power where. And you can see from this why Turbo is just typically the answer. The turbo car obviously makes more power almost everywhere. Peak power, Rotrex was at 260 horsepower. The turbo car is making 253, so basically identical peak power. But this is where you have to start taking other things into consideration, like the fact that the Rotrex kit is easier to install. It's also arguably more reliable as you don't have to worry about things like breaking turbo studs or turbo studs coming loose, blowing out turbo gaskets, cracking down pipes, a lot of extra heat the turbochargers put into the engine bay, extra fluid lines associated with turbochargers, and the fact that you get to make the same peak horsepower while putting 40 to 50 foot pounds less torque into your stock rods, your stock transmission, and your stock differential. In fact, Track Dog Racing has actually made 315 wheel horsepower out of a stock Miata engine with this identical Rotrex setup. How are they able to do that? Well, because it only took 226 pound feet of torque to make 315 horsepower because Rotrex makes its power so high up in the RPM range. So that's one awesome thing about this setup is I would say it is the safest way to shoot for 300 horsepower on a stock block. And I know some of you out there are thinking, just do the same exact thing with a turbo setup and have your boost control to where it emulates the boost curve of a Rotrex where it starts off at low boost and then it continuously raises into the high RPM. And yes, you can absolutely do that to limit your torque down low, but it's not as easy. Tuning boost control that way can be pretty tricky and you can end up with big boost spikes where you end up with 10 extra pounds in an RPM where you don't really want it. With the Rotrex, the boost is mechanically limited. You don't have to worry about boost control over boosting or anything like that. Anyways, I hope some of that information was helpful to you guys. At this point, let's go ahead and jump into that old comment section and check out some of your guys' most interesting questions. All right, of course I'm gonna start with my boys over at Patreon. Jacob says, in terms of DIY builds, did you find it easier to install the Rotrex system versus a turbo build? And do you have any plans of going E85? Briefly touched on this earlier, I think it is a little bit easier to install the Rotrex system as a whole. You just have less systems on the engine to mess with, mostly the exhaust system, you don't have to touch it, and then you don't have to worry about oil feed and drain. So as far as E85 on my car, not in the near future. I don't really wanna push much past 250, 260 horsepower, but it's extremely tempting because the fuel system in the NB is 100% ready for E85. I could go down the street right now, put E85 in it, assuming I had my laptop and I could scale the fuel table, blah, 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 throw a few degrees of timing at it and get up probably into the 275, 280 range, no problem. So it's tempting, but I kinda like having that longer range of normal gasoline and I just don't wanna push the motor that hard quite yet. Brandon says, 
curious about the overall tuning experience for turbo versus supercharger. Again, I would say the supercharger was much easier. To me, it's pretty much like doing an NA tune because boost is just fixed. You don't have boost control to worry about at all. That's the main difference between turbo and supercharged tuning. And yes, it does just seem like, well, it's just that one thing, like just tune boost, what's the big deal? But boost control for me has always been a huge part of getting the tune locked in. It's not as easy as it sounds, especially when you're using electronic boost control and you're really trying to chase good, accurate boost control, especially 20 plus pounds of boost. And when you're dealing with a four port boost controller, like on my car, it, it definitely adds some complexity to it. The road trucks tune was basically use the base NA tune, which the engine already had on it from previous sessions, set up the fueling for the amount of boost it runs, set up the timing map, and there's not much else to it. Alden asks, in the last video you said Rotrex is great for the stock engine, what did you mean? The setup increasing boost all the way to redline, yeah, that's actually exactly what I mean, in that Rotrex makes torque in the high RPM and it doesn't overload the engine with low RPM torque. So if you wanna make a lot of horsepower safely, Rotrex is a great way to do it because it's only gonna make power up in the high RPM where it's a lot easier on the stock rods, the stock transmission, and the stock differential. Second part of the question, could you use a smaller pulley and a wastegate slash electronic boost controller? The thing about altering the pulley size and trying to generate extra boost with the Rotrex at low RPM, they have a recommended maximum RPM limit. And if you start to pulley down too much, you will start exceeding that RPM limit. So the setup that I have on the Miata right now is actually spinning the road tracks to the limit or actually just slightly above the limit in the very high RPM range. So if I pulley down any more, I'll be overspinning that road tracks more than I'm comfortable doing. Luke, this is one of my favorite questions and I got a special answer for you. The thing that puts me off road tracks is in my mind, they're not positive displacement like a proper roots or twin screw, which is true. So surely they have lag just like a turbo. Since I hate turbo lag, then surely you should just go to a normal blower like a roots for that linear power experience. I tell you what, Let's go out and do a real world test. Do Rotrex supercharger systems have lag? As you can see, I have the supercharged NB with me and we're here to road test a few fun things to help answer some of your guys' burning questions. Now, one of the most exciting things I'm gonna road test right now is do centrifugal superchargers have lag compared to say a fast spooling turbo setup or a roots style supercharger setup? Okay, I should add here that Rotrex superchargers really don't like rev limiter and two-step. I, I think they don't like that rapid direction change. It's not good for the gearbox. So try not to do what I just did. The RPM came up so quick, I wasn't even ready for it. So yes, I did smash the limiter, but if you got a Rotrex, try to not do that. All right, hopefully that gave you an idea of just how responsive this supercharger is, but in case it didn't, let's take a look at the data log. So here we have RPM in green, throttle position in yellow, and boost in red. So we're cruising along in steady state and all of a sudden I stab the throttle up to 100% throttle position, and in the same frame, the TPS hits 100%. The maximum amount of boost that can be created by the supercharger is inside the engine, not even a delay of one frame. So the response is as good as if it was naturally aspirated. In between gears, it's the same thing. I let off the throttle and in the same frame, I'm at 100% throttle. The supercharger is at nine pounds of boost. It is immediate. So how does that compare to my high compression, high response turbo engine in my other car? Well, let's take a look. Even in the best case scenario, where the turbo will spool up the absolute fastest, which is a high RPM flat shift. I'm not even lifting off the throttle. It's just an ignition cut. From the time the ignition comes back on to when that turbo reaches full boost is still 0.3 to 0.4 seconds. Now that is ridiculously fast, but it is certainly not instant. For comparison purposes, I also have a data log from my friend's modified Mazda Speed Miata. And just on a normal shift here, from the time the car's at full throttle to the time it reaches 10 pounds of boost is eight 
eight tenths of a second. So it takes almost a full second for the turbo to spool up. Crazy that it takes that long for such a small turbo to come online, but I hope that gives you some context into just how fast the supercharger responds. Eric asks, what about heat management? Is there any difference with a turbo setup? I'm not huge on tracking my cars. I kind of spend more time building them and just street driving them as anyone who follows the channel well knows. So maybe someone in the comments could chime in if you've tracked both a turbo setup and a road track setup with your experience. What I can tell you is if you're tracking a forced induction Miata, heat management is going to be one of the biggest barriers that you're gonna have to get through no matter what type of forced induction you use. Let's move on over to YouTube and see what the subscribers have to ask. Now, I'm gonna start with the most common question I got across all my social medias, and that is, will I be running nitrous with the supercharger? I know so many people would love to see it, but hear me out on this one. I don't really see the point in running nitrous with the supercharger. If I wanted more power, I could just go to E85 and pretty much push the limits of the stock block. So why would I want to have a whole separate complex system that's gonna add just a tiny bit of extra power on top of what the supercharger already makes but is still below what the stock block can handle. To me, it's just it's not really worth it. I do still have the nitrous system so I might install it into something else, undecided. And as far as building the engine, I just don't really have that much of an interest in building another BP. I already have a built one. It already makes tons of power and I'm very satisfied with it. So I'd rather start putting effort into something else. Please do a zero to 60. Oh, I definitely will be performance testing the supercharge and be the same way that I did with the nitrous setup. It's not gonna be in this video because I do have to coordinate travel to another part of the solar system in order to legally do that, but it's coming, don't worry. Tom asks, can you drive with an open blow off valve? And if so, how does it sound? Well, Tom, let's go find out. Going Rotrex versus K24 swap. Okay, in my opinion, if you're building a track car, I honestly think K24 would be a better choice just because you can take pretty much a stock engine out and nothing's gonna beat the reliability of a stock engine. But I love building street cars and I don't mind blowing up an engine here and there, so hence why everything I own is forced induction. All right, this is gonna be the last question, but definitely one of the most important. Big Lair 155 from YouTube asks, 
essentially what are the things that you need to have to install this kit and what are the things that you should have to install this kit. So as far as what you need to just go supercharged, really all you need is the kit itself a way to manage fuel and a way to lower your timing. And that doesn't even necessarily mean you need a standalone ECU. The same way you can do turbo on a stock ECU, you can technically do this on a stock ECU. You would just need something like a fuel management unit, which is gonna raise fuel pressure with boost at a higher ratio than the stock fuel pressure regulator. And you'll want a way to pull a few degrees of timing out of the map, either retarding the cast if you have an NA, or if you have an NB, you'll need one of those crank angle sensor angle modifiers. And if you do plan on going stock ECU, I would certainly run one of the smaller superchargers and pulling it down to where it's only gonna make seven or eight pounds of boost just to be extra safe. However, a standalone ECU definitely highly recommended just because you get the tunability and a lot of the safeties that you wouldn't get running a stock ECU. And at that point, of course, you'll go to bigger injectors and you won't worry about a fuel management unit. As far as the fuel pump, that's really good for up to 200 wheel horsepower safely. If you're gonna go above that, a pump is a good idea. Right around that 200 plus range, you're gonna wanna think about a clutch. Now you can get away with running more horsepower power through a stock clutch with a Rotrex just because it doesn't make as much torque as a turbo but still 200 wheel horsepower you're looking at 150 plus foot pounds at the wheels that's going to be right around where the stock clutch is going to be getting a little sketchy. Cooling upgrades technically you don't need a cooling upgrade to run the system but it's an excellent idea once you start adding boost to your engine to at least get an upgraded radiator and make sure all of your maintenance is up to date. If you're tracking your car probably a good idea to put an oil cooler in as well. And the last thing I could really think of is as you saw in my video I did upgrade the harmonic balancer in my opinion it's just a safety thing at 200 to 250 horsepower eh, you might be safe with the stock damper but why not just spend that few hundred bucks on a little bit of safety if you shatter a set of oil pump gears you're gonna wish you could go back in time and spend the few hundred bucks on an upgraded damper so anyways that is my two cents on everything involving road treks I hope I answered as many questions as possible and I want to give another huge shout out to all of my recent patrons which are on screen right now thank you guys so much for the support it means the world and it means i can keep cranking out videos like this but anyways that is enough for me for today i will catch you guys in the next one peace out